Welcome to Oregon Voters Digest, the program that brings forward the social and political issues that are important to people living here in the Pacific Northwest. And now, your host, Bruce Broussard. Welcome again to this segment, folks, of the Oregon Voters Digest. I'm Bruce Broussard, your host. We're going to have quite an hour here. We've got some very interesting things we're going to be talking about. And actually, uh, we've always talked about the whole issue of police. And uh, we're going to spend a little time on that piece. And then we're going to just maybe hit some other general subject areas. And we just happen to have a, an up-and-coming poet and writer and publisher within our midst. And uh, you'll recognize her as we go along in the state. But this first segment part of the show, we're going to talk a bit about, um, about local police, Portland police, law enforcement. And we've been doing some of those things. And yeah. uh, my guest is Don Coupe and, and Teresa DePay Kennedy, both. And uh, I've, I've, we've spent a great deal of time, and I've spent a great deal of time with them in regards to seeing what can we do, if you will, to improve the relationships, relationship here in the Portland metropolitan area as far as law enforcement is concerned. Yeah. And uh, so the, the point is not to, to, to chastise any side of the equation. We've got to have law enforcement, and we've got to be able to work together. And as, as the point that we've always made, it's about law enforcement. It's not just police. And they're, they're just basically not the leading component of, uh, of our society here in the Portland metro area. It's the people. It's still a government. It's still a police force of the people, by the people, and for the people. And we're represented by the mayor and the city council. And then, therefore, the, the, the folks who are basically engaging, if you will, and, and implementing policy mm -hmm. are those individuals who are in law enforcement. And so, anyways, but anyway, that gives you a feel for where we're going to be going with this piece, so you'll understand that. You're talking about the ideal, the, the, but not necessarily reality. Exactly, <laughs> exactly, exactly. And we want engagement, if you will, from the public yeah. as well. As to, Normally it's just a one-sided area, but we really want engagement of the public. It's very, very important, because otherwise there's no way in the world one small entity can just basically do the whole job. It Who takes are the employers? The, 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 well, the, empl the people. That's right. Very that's much right. so. Very they much are the so. employers. Very so we need so. to pay attention to exactly, that. Exactly. Exactly. And we've got an example here. Yeah. Of, and that was another area that we were we'd been in, uh, we're looking at in terms of uh, we'd sort of in, in, through DePay and thanks to DePay and Don, you know, who who's a, was a former police officer. And, uh, and then the, with Teresa, who is a writer and a publisher in her own rights or whatever, We've been basically looking at uh, in various incidents from a historical standpoint to maybe to get us a, give us a feel of uh, what was happening during the particular time that got us to this point where there's always suspect, if you will, by the people, yeah. and we we've got and we are talking about that. So that's the positiveness, if you will, of, of maybe looking into history, uh, whether you whether you feel good about it or don't don't feel good about it. The fact that it did happen, okay. And in this particular case, what we're going to talk about today is that. Uh, <clears throat> From the Oregon Historical Society, I guess they commissioned, if you will, a couple of people to do do a report, i.e., via through the City Club of Portland, uh, a, a uh, report on the, on police community relations in Portland's Albina district from 1964 to 1985. I got the report here in my particular hand, and uh, the people who were commissioned to do that was Leanne C. Cerbulo and Karen J. Gibson. Both are active professors right now here That's correct. at Portland, Portland State, <clears throat> professors here. And they wrote this re report in 2013 for the Oregon Historical Society. They were commissioned by them. So it was interesting. And then after the City, City, City Club of Portland, who, who are very active, if you will, and they do a, a monthly uh, a gathering, if you will. But they, they did the interview, all this kind of stuff. But they were actively involved in this whole process also, too. But we got this report. And, we, and there, there are a number of things that are there, but you can get a copy of this black and blue police community relations in Portland, Alabama District, 64 to 85, at the Oregon Historic Society. You can get a you copy. You can get it off the internet. Or, yeah. or you can get it off the internet, There's right? There's a PDF. You have the PDF yeah. on that piece, okay. But so the whole idea is that between Teresa and, and, and Don, who again, like I said, who, who was a who was a former Portland police officer, went in and just did a little research on this piece and read the report and just all of a sudden they found some issues. And then yeah. that's the point that we're making here. I mean, do we have the accurate report? And you know, the fact of the matter is things happen a lot mm -hmm. of times uh, in whatever writings for that matter, There's a, there might be a question. But in this particular case, it's so important that I think it's, it's important that you maybe pick a copy of the report. And then it's an understanding that, that uh, Teresa, and, and, between Teresa and Don, they're gonna be coming up with, uh, with it, if, if you will, an update, if you will, uh, mm -hmm. of, of some of the facts that were, were laid out in this particular report. 
okay? Yeah. And they were able to do it. They did a fine job. There were several areas that they, uh, they looked at, and uh, what we're going to do, we're going to discuss at least just one of those areas to begin with. They, they're not through with the report yet. We're no, still... it's, it's right here, and okay. we have currently 36 pages. 36 pages. Wow. How many pages do we have over here on this 30. one? 30. 30. See, so, just, so my point is, that, and we got to be pretty factual. So we, they're mm -hmm. really looking into this thing. And we're going to give you the opportunity also to, to hear this side. And we encourage you, if you will, to be able to respond. You can either respond to me, and uh, if not that, write us something or whatever. But, you know, we want to we we lay it out the way it's supposed to be. The, the report was Don's idea. After okay. our, it's called the Black and Blue Retort Report. Mm -hmm. Police Community Relations in Portland's Albina District, Good. 1961 to 1967, Good. from the perspective of a working PPB police officer and active participant. Sam, so that's, that's our title. Um, and we wrote it, um, we're writing it together. Don is the main writer. I'm kind of hel uh, helping to polish and, mm -hmm. and get it cleaned up. But it's because Don read the Black and Blue uh, report by Sir Bulo yeah. and Gibson, and a lot of it was very uh, frustrating for him because yeah. he realized he that... He was there during that time, right. too. That's, that's right. the important thing about this whole peace yeah. aspect of it. So like I said, we're going to come up with a report, and I take it uh, the, the Oregon Historical Society are anxious to get a copy. That's what I believe. The, something. Yeah. Yes. They, they want to get a copy of this report, yeah. which is good because yeah. we're having the discussion right. right and purposely we're having it purposely because we want a better relationship mm -hmm. we do we, yeah. we we're in some better critical times at this point in time and we're in portland oregon we're in oregon and we're trying to respond we, we're not talking about the national report we're responding yeah. to our issues here right. here locally I, I think the issue really with the black and blue report by mm -hmm. sir and gibson is they presented a very biased agenda um, in their report, and I, I think it's important that Don um, shares his perspective in the response essay. Right. Not all white police officers in PPB during the 60s mm -hmm. were racist, mm -hmm. um, and he certainly was not. He was a practically social worker in a lot of respects. Mm -hmm. So I think that our response essay, um, the good that it will do is present um, a look back historically that's more accurate yeah 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 and yeah. and of course don and i you know we're both born and raised here so we you know especially don you know with his perspective that goes back to the 60s mm -hmm. so that's that's a positive i think for our response essay yeah. so at the end of the day like i said you'll have two 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 reports yeah, yeah. at the oregon historic society mm -hmm. yeah. and maybe maybe there might be another discussion at the mm -hmm. city club you know what i mean <laughs> why not you know yeah. what i mean and then it, it's going to be open and hopefully the city club will <coughs> respond by mm -hmm. basically Open, doing a, a open forum, if you will, mm -hmm. to the entire citizens, if you will, mm -hmm. yeah. and and I and get this report so we can start talking about some. Well, what, what, where do we go from here? Because we got issues. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? And now naturally with the, well, I don't, I won't go into that piece. We got some other issues. <laughs> okay, but there were several areas here that we were looking at um, having a little quick discussion here on this, and we we, we cited one, and uh, this was uh, agreed to by both uh, Don and and Teresa, and that was. Uh, uh, there was one. On, I'll, I'll read. The, I'll read the, par the, the paragraph. Mm -hmm. Cleotus Rhodes was not intentionally allowed to bleed to death in the back seat of police officer Ed Freeman's car in 1964, and the reason will be explained in detail in the Black and Blue Report retort report, as co-authored by Don Dupay and his wife Teresa, soon to be a, to be published. So we want to talk about that. Cleotus Rhodes. I, I guess it was. It was. It was. A, it was. It was a high high-profile case mm -hmm. from the community's aspect of right. it and also the police and everybody was involved and so we're going to give you just a little brief note if right. you will on this piece that's what we're going to discuss at this point in time there's several others so why don't we start off with you know, who wants to start off with and talk to about who is Cletus Road now we're talking about Northeast Portland right mm -hmm. black community aspect of it right mm -hmm. you want to you start Cletus off? Cletus Rhodes was a, an African-American man who um, was pulled over by Ed Freeman for driving erratically um, he was uh, presumed to be drunk. He was driving recklessly. In Northeast Portland. In Northeast yes. Portland. Um, and I think he may have actually not been pulled over. He may have eluded and then he drove to his house or um, anyway. Was that in the report? Did you pick? Did you yes, look at the report? It's the, the, the the black and blue report by Sir Bulo and Gibson is is pretty um, clear oh, this about what happened. This is not the happened. police report. This is we we're, actually, we, were, we were just referring yeah. to this document here. <coughs> yeah. Okay. Basically, good. the issue is that Cleotus Rhodes was shot in the back by Ed Freeman, and he was killed. And what 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 um, Gibson and Sir Bulo are suggesting, um, it's an actual video on YouTube, um, and they're discussing their report. And what Karen Gibson was suggesting by what, you know, her tone and the things she was saying was that um, Ed Freeman drove Cleotus Rhodes to the sanitarium hospital on 60th and Belmont so that he would bleed to death in the back of his patrol car. Mm -hmm. That's actually not 
true. Um, the the issue is that they didn't. Now, wait, you mentioned sanitarium. I it's mean, called what, what the called it, no. it was called the Portland Sanitarium Hospital. It was on 60th. Portland Sanitarium. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I'm saying, but mine's, I, I'm just clearing it up. Here. Right. Yeah. You yeah. think yeah. like mental asylum? Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> but why a sanitarium? It's yeah. not it the hospital. It was a hospital. It was a it hospital. Was a hospital. Okay. Yeah. Portland. Yeah. okay. And so basically what, what they were not privy to is police procedure during 1964. And they, they failed to do enough digging. They didn't do enough research. They didn't interview any retired police officers during that time or any retired ambulance drivers during that time. Mm -hmm. And basically that section of our response essay is um, addressing uh, this thing. It's an aspect of police procedure. And during 1964, it was called the hospital of the day. Mm -hmm. And this is something they were not privy to. In 1964, um, most of the crime, a lot of the crime, Don says most of the crime in the city happened in Elvina. If they didn't have this procedure where they had the hospital of the day, all of these crime victims would go to Emanuel, and Emanuel would have been overloaded. And, it, and so they created a system that they called the hospital of the day. So on any given day of the week, they would take crime victims to either Emanuel, Providence, um, Good Samaritan or uh, St. Vincent's. St. Vincent's or the um, the, hosp the sanitarium <coughs> hospital. Where, where was it located as compared to? 60th and uh, Belmont. As opposed so, to? As, as opposed to Emanuel, Emanuel which, which, which was a couple blocks away. Right. Yeah. And so wow. Ed Freeman probably, hey, number one, he had to call the precinct to ask for permission to transport because in 1964, police officers were not allowed to transport, transport their prisoners or anyone else in their vehicle. They had to mm -hmm. wait for the paddy wagon. Mm -hmm. so, or um, the ambulance. Or the ambulance. No. And so um, he, he probably called in for permission to transport because he had him in the back of his patrol car and he had to find out the hospital of the day. It was not Emanuel, it was Portland Sanitarium Hospital. And so he took him to that hospital. The fact that he put him in his patrol car means that he was worried enough about his state to act as quickly as possible as opposed to waiting five minutes for an ambulance to arrive. But Nish, let's go back. Now, He's driving erratic, okay, mm -hmm. and then he stops him. I take it, right? Or, right. or did he drive? I home? think he eluded, and he he eluded, and he went back home. There was a scuffle on the front porch between. So he followed him home. That's right. what it was. Yeah. He followed him home. Right, right. and okay. there was a scuffle on the front porch between the officer and Cleotis Rhodes, and Cleotis. Uh, the officer's gun supposedly fell out of his holster on the front porch, and Cleotis Rhodes' wife went over and picked up the gun and handed it back to officer. Back to the Freeman. officer, uh, on, the, on his front porch. On his front yeah. porch. And then um, he was able to get him into custody, put him in his car, and he was taking him to, to jail. And something happened during that process, and I think he, he tried to escape the vehicle, got but out. That, that, but we haven't seen the police report. No, that's not what he said. Okay, we didn't see that part. Well, it's it's, really it's in it's in the the black and it's in black and blue. Okay, by okay. Sir Bulo and Gibson, he he um, escaped and somehow Ed Freeman shot him in the back and killed him. But the other thing is, um, there was a grand jury investigation and the judge said that that Ed Freeman's conduct was indefensible. So what he did was wrong, clearly. But unfortunately, in 1964, it also was not against policy to shoot a fleeing felon in the back. In the back, that's what they did. You know, that was policy in 1964. So though Ed Freeman didn't do anything against policy, what he did was wrong and it was immoral mm -hmm. and he could have he could have made a better decision. Mm -hmm. um, so that's basically but, it. But being in the car, and <coughs> Don can maybe throw a little bit more on the tree, mm -hmm. the fact that he was just by himself, there was no, he had no assistance with had him no at all. no cover. Right. And then the, the <coughs> idea that he put him in the car, he wasn't shot yet at that point in time. Mm -hmm. uh, did he drive off from, from the house and, and, and while he was driving off or whatever? Yes. Uh, all of a sudden, he, he jumped out of the car. Did he did something. He, he tried hand, to elude. Was there again. any handcuffs involved? Or, I'm not uh, sure. What, was it was the was the area was the doors locked and he couldn't get well, out? Well, that's or, the other thing. What's the deal? With yeah, that? the police cars back then didn't have uh, roll bars, so they were not secure the way they are today. So they, so the car yeah. wasn't locked. Right. It wasn't yeah. locked. No. So he yeah. was sitting in the back seat. He could have. He could have. No he no could have. Well, he. We don't know if he was handcuffed or not, but he could have reached up and tried to assault the officer while he was driving because there were no roll bars, so it wasn't a secure police car in the sense that cars are today. Yeah, but I mean, I'm not even. I'm just a lay person. I wouldn't put nobody in the back. I'm, I'm much better to be in the front seat, mm -hmm. if you will. If that's the case, you got mm -hmm. what I'm mean? Don, how would? Can you talk a little bit about that? That during that particular time, how does one go about arresting someone? Well, uh, we arrested people, time? but we uh, you do? put them in handcuffs and called the wagon. Yeah, exactly. And if they were injured, then we called an ambulance. Yeah, right. But this was so critical that Ed Freeman felt he had to get him to the hospital immediately. Yeah, but what about before? 
why, why didn't they just call the wagon to come pick him up? When well, they had this scuffle. That would have been wagon. ideal, there but was he was a wagon. scuffle and he was shot. So that eliminates the paddy wagon. Okay. But now we're down to the ambulance. Right. So mm -hmm. are we going to wait for an ambulance? And Ed Freeman decided he was not going to wait for the ambulance. He would take him to the hospital himself. So I'm sure that he had to get permission from a sergeant to do that and then took him to the hospital. He was criticized, and the report says they drove him around and let him die because they took they, him to they, a far was it two away people? hospital. Sir Bula and Gibson, the writers of Black yeah. and Blue, the authors of Black and Blue, are mm -hmm. suggesting um, that they allow that uh, Freeman allowed Rhodes to bleed to death in the back of the car because they did not have access to this aspect of police procedure because well, they, they didn't, didn't research it. They well, didn't do yeah. enough research. They, their research, research okay. methods were not really. Which is something we, we're yeah. doing right now, and yeah. we're going to be looking into a little bit more. But in terms of the paddy wagon, in mm -hmm. 1964 there was one paddy wagon for the whole city. It was called 99. Mm. Paddy wagon 99. Mm. There was one. Mm. So a lot of times something would happen and police officers would have to wait 45 minutes to an hour mm -hmm. before the paddy wagon could finally arrive. Mm -hmm. So in this case, um, Freeman was desperate to get him to the hospital. And so he put him, he called and asked for permission to transport. And then he drove him to the sanitarium hospital, which was the, the hospital of the day mm -hmm. during that day. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately he bled to death. But the fact that he jumped out the car, I guess he jumped out the yeah, car. He tried his, to stand. Uh, his behavior was atrocious. Okay, but he yeah. shot. But he was shot in he was the back. Shot in the you back. Know, we we were all That's visualized right. yeah. back east. Right. Somebody got right. shot in the back. Yes. You know, for for this, that, and the other. So I want to make sure we get clear here. Yeah. And we don't have the police report yet, right? No. no. And we we were looking into that, mm -hmm. which they didn't do. That's why we were kind of like. I right? don't think they had access, or they may not have had access to any of those police personnel files. They may simply have not known mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. they were. Public can, can we get those? Are we going to be able to get those? There's uh, 120 boxes of police personnel wow, files wow. in the so, Portland Archives and Records Center. And in that Center. file, there was anything of that nature, right? Mm -hmm. They're a uh, they're public record, and anyone can look at them. But I don't know if Karen uh, uh, Gibson and Leon Serbulo, during their research, I don't know if they if they well, had hey, access. Hi, Karen. Leon, um, would you mind giving, giving Teresa a call <laughs> or whatever? Well, Ed but Freeman was, was criticized for not sending him to the hospital in an ambulance. Mm -hmm. And what they don't understand is... If Ed Freeman had awaited five or six more minutes for an ambulance, mm -hmm. uh, Rhodes's condition would have deteriorated even more, and the ambulance would have taken him not to Emmanuel. The ambulance would have taken him to the hospital of the day. Mm -hmm. so, so he, yeah. so Freeman's concern for his security and safety of the guy that he shot uh, was to take him to the hospital, which he did. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, my criticism of it is, in retrospect. He should not have shot him, mm -hmm. but this is hindsight. Mm -hmm. uh, he should not have shot him because he had the car and he knew where he lived. Mm -hmm. So if you got the car and you know where they live, let him go. We go get him with a warrant tomorrow. Mm -hmm. with, with another officer or whatever. The officer so couldn't get a warrant there, tomorrow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's that's the failure of, of Officer Freeman and what he should have done and what he didn't do. Mm -hmm. We're looking at this in hindsight, of course, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but he made a mistake in my opinion. Mm -hmm. But he didn't do it because he wanted to drive the guy around until he died. Mm -hmm. and that, that part of the report suggestion is nonsense. You know, a more current definition in regards to following someone that way, and like I said, knowing where they are and whatever, the, 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 yeah. not too long ago, the issue of profiling brought kind of, yeah. would, would, that, would, that, would that fall in within that particular? Uh, you know? I don't think so. Okay. The, the, this, this wasn't profiling because uh, he stopped, a, he stopped a, a guy in a car that was acting crazy, okay. driving crazy, okay. endangering people. He stopped him. That was his job. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And also, the, another thing is uh, Don worked with Ed Freeman. He knew Ed Freeman, and he told me when we discussed this that you know he wasn't really a bad guy he was, bad guy, no. you know he was he was a personable friendly guy um, that doesn't mean that he didn't harbor racist beliefs he mm -hmm. may have mm -hmm. none of us really know mm -hmm. but um, the, the main point that we're trying to make in our response essay is that when writing an important academic essay like this like they wrote yeah, black and yeah, blue yeah. Um, it's important to observe proper uh, research methods, and yeah. they didn't because they didn't interview any retired police officers during that time. They didn't interview any EMTs or ambulance drivers during that time, and they could have. Mm. If they had done a little more digging, they could have presented a report that was much more factual and much more nuanced mm. Mm. Okay. instead of being so right. clearly biased. Well, let's, let's, talk, let's go a little bit further. Now, okay, fine. Now, he's taking them over to the, uh, the asylum, the hospital aspect yeah. of it, and taking now the, the guy bled to death, right? 
He died. He died mm -hmm. right there. Okay, of the gun, uh, getting shot in the back, if you will. Yeah. So then now there's a, there's an in inquest or inquiry or whatever. Now it goes normally goes to the DA, right, or somebody, yeah. or whatever. So what happened? What happened then? They didn't prosecute him. They didn't prosecute him. They didn't him. prosecute him because he did nothing legally wrong. He he didn't do anything outside of policy. Mm -hmm. But the judge did say that killing Cleotis Rhodes was, quote, indefensible. Okay. And it was. But unfortunately, in 1964, shooting a fleeing felon in the back was not out of policy. So then, so, so. in the rest of it, he was found guilty. No, he was found not guilty. He was found not, not, not guilty, guilty right. of anything. We're, we're, we're even, right. the, even, though, even though the we're judge We're talking says about legal right. and we're talking right. about moral. Right. Okay. He didn't do anything legally wrong. But, but he did it I have questions about the morality of right. what he did. What about right. the judge? Is that what the judge the, said? The judge uh, said, yes, what you did was indefensible, but he couldn't <laughs> convict him because what he did was not outside of police policy mm -hmm. for 1964. So, so what happened to him? Did he stay on the force? He stayed on the force. He went back to work. He, he went was, back to work. Yeah. Did he get two weeks off or something? No, I don't think so. When did that come into effect? Come that that, that, you know, uh, that came along when Internal Affairs came along. Ah, okay, yeah, okay, yeah. okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm, just saying, I'm just asking you from yeah, time to time. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. So the judge just let him go, so to speak. Well, he didn't let him go. We didn't have him in the first place, so you yeah. can't let him go if you yeah. don't have okay. him. Okay, all right, okay, good. Just just, just let me, you know, talk when, a I, bit when I first read this thing, yeah. it's what made me mad is the first is the first blurb right here. Go on. And this, and this is from the report. This is yes. right off the black and blue report. It says, it appears that there is sufficient evidence to believe that the Portland Police Department indulges in stop and frisk practices in Albina. They seem to feel that they have the right to stop and frisk someone because his skin is black and he is in the black part of town. When I read that, yeah. my blood started yeah, to boil yeah, yeah. because it's nonsense. Mm -hmm. There was no stop and frisk. We weren't even allowed to stop and frisk. During that time? During that time period. If I, I couldn't frisk you if I didn't arrest you. I couldn't put handcuffs on you if I didn't arrest you. There was no handcuffing people for the officer's safety or security in those days. There was no stop and frisk. In, in other you words, had to, I had to decide if you had broke the law and I was going to rush you and put handcuffs on you. And that's the way it was. Yeah. There was There was none of this... Because your skin is black and you're in a black part of town, I can mm -hmm. I can stop and frisk mm -hmm. you. We didn't do that. Mm -hmm. But you know, when our con many of us we've had conversations here about yeah. the book you've written and this that, and the other. But you were really doing in many in many ways community policing because a lot of times you knew your turf. I knew my and turf. you knew the people in your turf. That's and right. It, and it was referenced to that point yeah. that, That's right. that Freeman knew exactly where the guy lives. Yeah. And, and as, yeah. you were, as a point to me, let him drive home, uh, get sober, whatever, and go yeah. back in the morning and no. you pick him up. If not that, you'd probably just be. I'm, yeah. I'm not talking for you, yeah. but I'm just saying, if something like that had happened, what would you have done? What would have been your process? I, when you get involved in the emotion of it, but I, 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 uh, I can't remember a time when I would have shot somebody in the back, mm -hmm. unless they had a gun or a knife and were going to go kill somebody else. Mm -hmm. I can't remember a time of shooting somebody in the back. Mm -hmm. I would have even considered it. Mm -hmm. No. Mm -hmm. Well, I wouldn't do it, no. Mm -hmm. But, you know, as, as, as you said, when you... If you're not coming after me, I'm not going to shoot you. Right, right. As I read your book and this, and that, I, I was also feeling that, that there was really true community policing in there. But at the same time, uh, sometimes some of the officers were a bit, a bit more aggressive, if you will, mm -hmm. of doing well, things. They knew where these were. They couldn't get out of the area. Yeah. Yeah. The area was pretty well restricted to yeah. to the black community aspect of it. And so I guess my point is that, um, but it was said a lot of times during that time, a lot of guys were being thrown in the back of the seat of the car and taken yeah. out to the park or something like that and yeah. and do a job on him. You know, yeah. just, just beat the hell out of him or something yeah. like that. Yeah, there was some street justice that police officers did in the 60s to local troublemakers. Um, one of them, his name was Buck Owens, and he threatened to kill Don. Mm -hmm. because he was angry because Don arrested him a couple of times for pimping and drug dealing, that kind of thing. And so two of Don's friends, this is in his book, went out and they found Buck Owens and they took him out to uh, Swan Island and beat the hell out of him. Mm -hmm. It was, mm -hmm. that was, I mean... That but he didn't shoot him in the back. No. <laughs> no, they didn't shoot him in the back. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah. Or no. the front. <laughs> okay, okay. But the other thing about Black and Blue by Sir Bulo and Gibson is that they say in that report that community policing was non-existent and that police officers during Don's time did not get out of their cars. That is not true. And Don will explain. Talk why. about that, Don. Yeah. Well, we got out of the car all the time because, you know, we talked to people on the street. Uh, we got out of the car to, to walk. Uh, many a time down on Mississippi Street, we walked. 
a beat. Yeah. We walked a beat. We'd get out of the car. We'd walk the alleys uh, on both sides of Mississippi Street behind the businesses or alleys. Mm -hmm. And alleys, uh, people would park in the alley, uh, bring out a crowbar, and try and pry the back door of some establishment open. So we were out of the car a lot. That's just not true. Yeah. They also said in the report that um, the only, the only in Albina were there one-man cars that we were afraid to get out of the car because mm -hmm. we were one-man cars. There were no one-man cars, per, per speaking, in those days. All the cars were two-man cars, mm -hmm. including the traffic cars. Mm -hmm. They were all two-man cars, very few one-man cars. So uh, the one-man car thing didn't come, into, uh, didn't come into play until years later, and it's always been a bad decision. Mm. In my reorganization of the police department, there wouldn't be any more one-man cars mm -hmm. because too many policemen are hurt waiting for backup. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, again, on that, that point that you just <coughs> made, yeah. you know, his, his, his uh, Freeman uh, on and his well, own, yeah. so to speak. That's right. And, you know, we've not seen the police report yet, but I'm just saying yeah. you never know what would have happened. Yeah. Either I don't like this guy and I'm going to do my thing on him or whatever, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. oh, he's on the porch, they're scuffing, you don't know what happened, transpired, yeah. gets in the car. Uh, why did he put him in the back seat without a handcuff? Yeah. Uh, you know what I mean? And yeah. as you say, uh, without a lock and no bars and whatever. So we don't know what the, but with the two person car, with the two person in that piece, this yeah. is a different mm -hmm. ball game. Yeah. Sometimes people cover for one another, mm -hmm. but still, uh, how, yeah. how much do you cover? And how far do you cover? Mm -hmm. But it was said, you know, not, I'll, I'll throw this out to you, Don. Mm -hmm. It was said that uh, a number of the officers at the time would, would like the idea of going to Northeast Portland and just, uh, just because it's, it was just a freedom. You know, it was just, you, you can do anything you want to do. That's just not true. Okay, talk. That but is, I'm just saying, that, that's out there. That is not true. We yeah. had rules. We had to obey the law. Okay. And I think that we were, uh, I think that we were a lot uh, stricter in those days in paying attention to the rules, okay. Okay. to the laws, okay. because um, we didn't, like I said, they didn't, we didn't have stop and frisk. I had to decide if you were doing something I could arrest you for. Mm -hmm. if, I, if I got, if I put handcuffs on you mm -hmm. without arresting you, I'm in trouble. I'm in trouble. Back in those days of 61, 2, 3, and 4, I'm in trouble because that was against policy. It's against the law. Has it, well, it's well, against the law. But, but the perception is that it has changed. It has changed. It has changed. It changed with some decision that said, I think it came from New York, but I'm not sure, that the policemen had the right to handcuff someone until they could figure out what they were doing. Hmm. You know, we didn't have that luxury. If it's a luxury, we had to decide that you were doing something wrong and arrest you for mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. So I think we were it was a lot stricter in those Right, days. right. Now, you know, again, we're talking again, we're talking about uh, IE policy. Well, and again, it's supposed to be a it's supposed to be a police force, uh, law enforcement po police force of the people, by the people, and for the people. Somebody had to sign off on that policy. Oh. And normally it's, it's the people who represent IE the people, IE the mayors, the mayor and the city council people. But then you had the DA also too. But it was a chain of command type yeah. situation. Well, what did you feel during that particular time? Did you feel that there was a process that you knew that the people were actually involved in terms of signing off on whatever policy that came down to your desk? All of our instruction came from the district attorney's office. Okay. If there was a rule change, uh, like when uh, uh, Miranda decision came along, right. that instruction came straight from the district attorney's office. So. Mm -hmm. And when they uh, finally did start allowing stop and frisk, that came from the district attorney's mm -hmm. office. So all of the policy changes, which ultimately the district attorney had to enforce the law, then then uh, that's where the information come from. Mm -hmm. We we got the information in roll call. Sometimes the district attorney would come and address us. Mm -hmm. Well, this is what this is the way it is now. Mm -hmm. You can't do it that way anymore. You have to advise people of their rights. Uh, Miranda is law, mm -hmm. and we have to obey that law. Mm -hmm. So, An another thing I'd yeah. like to mention is that. Um, in, got about another minute. Okay, in the black and blue report by Sir Bula and Gibson, they suggest that that public safety was not important to police officers, and it it simply was. And the other thing that a lot of police officers during Dawn's time did was they brought food boxes regularly to people in Northeast Portland and mm -hmm. St. John's. They brought food boxes to poor white families, poor black families, poor Native American families. That was part of their job. And they were helped in that process by the Sunshine Division. I was going to ask you that. Yeah. Yeah. When did that start, the Sunshine Division? Sunshine Division has been around yeah. since the 1920s. 1926. Yeah, okay. so it's been around a long time. 1926. But, you know. mm, interesting, interesting. So, well, well, look, 
uh, we're going to go on and take a break. And uh, this has been a great report. And so hopefully I'll be waiting for the next the next tier, if you will, yeah. right? We're, we're gonna, almost done with it. We're going to get done with it. And then and hopefully I'll I'll try to get in touch with uh, Leanne and uh, and Karen and mm -hmm. see whether or not they might enter, entertain the idea to have them of on. coming on at the same time. Yeah. You know? Because the city club is so busy, you know, with a lot yeah. of other things. And But the bottom line is that I'll even ask the city club. Maybe we can mm -hmm. do that, too. Yeah. We're going to ask the city club and see whether or not we can do that. Because I think this I think it's very important that we can go back in time. I think it's important happens, that you know? we unrevise the revisionist history. Right. I think it's very, very I don't important. mind you talking about me as long as you tell the truth. Well, I'm going to talk but about you. But don't tell anybody. anybody. Don't tell anybody that I was a racist killer. Really? Yeah, I wasn't. Yeah. I got to see that report. Will you okay. write that up? Yeah. <laughs> okay, good job. Look, thanks, folks, for being with us. Thank you all. Thank okay, you. Good. And uh, we'll see you next time around. I'll catch you in the next round. You are watching Oregon Voters Digest. This program can be seen again on these channels on these dates and times. Tell a friend. Welcome again to this segment of the Oregon Voters Digest. Again, I'm Bruce Broussard, your host. And hey, I've got a, I've got, we got quite a 30 minutes here that we're going to be spending to spending some time with a new author, author publisher within our midst, and uh, and also bringing on another co co-author uh, on this same issue. But well, again, talking about police work here in the city of Portland to get a further, if you will, feel for what's going on to to better our situation of, of law enforcement and understanding within our community, okay? And I'm gonna, I'm gonna read this piece and then we'll get it. And you notice you see Teresa right here, Teresa DuPay Kennedy. Okay, she's one of those authors. It says, this is a new crime history book, co-authored with Day D. Chandler and called Murder and Scandal in Prohibition Portland, okay? Vice, sex, and misdeeds in Mayor's, Mayor Baker's reign, Mayor Baker's reign. This is uh, JD's, uh, JD Chandler's, uh, fourth book with the history press and uh, Teresa's first book with the history press how about that that's gonna be great so you guys are just joining forces now yeah wow that's yeah. huge this guy's big he's an established uh, writer he's wow. a crime writer and a historian and has gathered a huge cache of information and data over the last 15 or 20 years wow. about various murders that have happened here in really? Portland yeah. really? what were some of the books that he's written um, he wrote um, Portland on the Take, that was his last book, um, Murder and Mayhem in Portland, and uh, the other book, um, I can't remember the title. <laughs> this is his fourth book, though, um, Murder and Scandal in Prohibition, Portland. Mm. And he's a working historian of crime history in Portland, and you can donate to his Patreon account. We, at, can, we, can, we can't do that. We part. can't do that. <laughs> we can't do that part. We can't do that part. Okay. okay. But he's a historian in okay. Portland, and... Um, he, you know, writing history is really time right, consuming right, and it's right, expensive right. because um, because uh, you have to do so much research and it, it costs money. I, I see. mean, I, I, I see. spent ninety dollars um, uh, with a woman over in Seattle um, mm -hmm. and to just to do a manual mm -hmm. search on three ledgers. Mm -hmm. It cost ninety dollars and she didn't find anything. Wow. So that's the wow. risk that you take. It's like, OK, it's, you know. Ninety dollars wow. to do this manual search for three ledgers, and then you wind up with nothing. Wow! <laughs> but it, but it's it's important work, mm -hmm. and especially yeah. with the, some of the things that we're we're tripping into doing. Mm -hmm. And then because you're part of that process, it makes it great. And you still mm -hmm. got Don. Yeah. And that's good. Yes. You guys have Don with him too. So yeah. So this this book aspect of it. So what's what's let's see now you got. Uh, um, let's talk about um, that particular book in terms of the whole issue. Well, it's about murder and scandal. It's and about what is it about? Mayor Baker was the mayor in the. 20s and 30s, and um, he was a, a theater actor who came to Portland, um, and he was part of the very corrupt 
political system of early Portland, Oregon. And um, it, the book deals with a lot of different aspects of crime. Um, it, there are some very interesting um, organized crime people that JD mentions. Um, he wrote most of the book. Um, I did some research and I wrote a, few, a couple chapters. And, um, but uh, it's a wonderful book. And um, my focus was Anna Schrader. Um, who disappeared in 1946. Um, she was uh, a woman who had an affair with a police lieutenant, William Bruning, from 1921 to 1929, and it ended badly, and they were both married, and she went to the Oregonian and spilled the beans, and mm -hmm. um, the police chief, um, Leon Jenkins at the time, uh, of course, what wanted... What year? What time? What, what time? This was 1929. 29? Okay. And he, he tried to support Bruning, of course, and they were. it, it looked like Bruning was going to be just fine until Anna Schrader came up with a love letter that he had written her in 1925 on um, Oregon State Fair stationery. Hmm. Um, and so she was able to prove that they had this affair, and then he lost his job. Hmm. And um, she continued to be a vocal um, critic of the Portland Police Bureau, um, accusing them of framing people, uh, accusing them of killing people. Um, this was oh. a very different Portland Police Bureau. And um, I think the Oregonian was doing it during that particular time. The Oregonian went wild with these articles. The, the, the story lasted about two years, um, just lots of really wild articles about the affair. And it was a huge sex scandal, which, you know, is you know, at, at that time was, it was really uncommon. Mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, let's see. And Phil Stanford too has also done some work in, in that era too. Yeah. He, he's well, more local. Or was, yeah. It was more current, if you will. He, he focused on the forties and the fifties. Right, right, right. Yeah. But this is, this is going back. Yeah, this is, um, this, this book is going back to the twenties. And part of the reason that JD decided to write it and asked me to be a part of it is okay. because I was able to find some really interesting, um, documentation in the old personnel police files that are at the Archives and Records Center. I found two letters that were written to Leon Jenkins, who was the police chief during 1930. Um, and uh, the letters had been taken out of um, two other files. So when a, when a, when a letter was written uh, by a secretary, um, it, if, if it was written about someone, everyone got a copy. So. A copy went to the person that, who wrote the letter in their personnel file, a copy went to the person that the letter was going to, and a copy went to the person that the letter was about. So if a police officer like um, Frank Irvin wrote a letter to Leon Jenkins complaining about patrolman, uh, this, this one patrolman um, who had had dealings with Anna Schrader, they would all get a copy. So I, I asked to look at all three personnel files. Leon Jenkins' personnel file was empty, didn't have the letters. Um, Frank Irvin's file didn't have the letters, but they forgot that the letter would be in, um, his name was uh, John, uh, um, I can't remember his last name, but the letters were found in this patrolman's personnel file. Hmm. And so I was just, it was one of those wonderful finds right. because the two letters basically confirm that bootlegging was going on, um, illegal bootlegging was going on at the police headquarters on Oak Street in 1930. And so these two letters were like real confirmation that that was happening. Mm -hmm. And that they hated Anna Schrader. Frank Irvin hated Anna Schrader. Um, and so I found these two letters and I showed them to J.D. Chandler and he was really excited. And mm -hmm. I think that's when he started thinking that he could write a book like this. But I also think he wanted to write this book um, for a long time before that anyway, because he had a lot of information about other aspects of the bootlegging and the mm -hmm. whole sale of liquor. So. So, so from an historical standpoint, what, what, what do you think the benefits are going to be in regards well, to this? The, the benefit is that, is that people have a, a greater understanding of Portland history. Okay. And the benefit mm -hmm. is that people think of Portland as this sleepy, wholesome little town. Mm -hmm. And Portland was just as corrupt as Los Angeles and, and Chicago and New York. I mean, they were doing, you know, these people were doing the same kinds of things. Mm -hmm. And um, our research into the disappearance of Anna Schrader is becoming more and more fascinating for me because um, I've just found out that there's no death record for her in the state of Oregon. There's no death record for her in Minnesota, where she where she was born and raised. Um, there's absolutely no record of her after the 1940 census. She disappeared in 1946. A person filed uh, published three um, little things in the personnel ads in the Oregonian asking if anyone had seen 
or if they knew the whereabouts of Anne Schrader, please contact them. She just disappeared off the face of the earth. Mm -hmm. And um, there's, uh, there's, my suspicion is that she is the torso that washed up in the Willamette River in 1946 of April of 1946. That's my suspicion. Because I've looked at some photos of the... Uh, did, they, did, they, did they identify it? Or well, there's no remains. No remains the remains no. were probably incinerated. Um, but I got some police files and um, from John Krimenacher of um, the Clackamas County Sheriff's Office. Mm -hmm. And um, I also have two photographs. I have a photograph of the skull that they found. And I have a photograph of Ann Schrader in the courtroom in 1929. And the photograph of the skull is kind of compelling because it was in the water for six months. Mm. But it the water was very cold, mm. so it was preserved fairly well. Mm. There's a thin veneer of flesh over the skull, and if you look at it, it's there are similarities between the planes of the skull, the, the lines and the planes of the skull, wow. and that of Anna Schrader in this one photograph mm. um, from 1929 or 1930, I think 1929. She's in the courtroom and she's just standing and she's staring at the camera and she's not smiling, so you can just see the planes of her face, and it's very similar. Well, this is going to be quite a read. Yeah, it's, it's, it's good. Read. So when, when are you looking in terms of completing it? Um, it's done. So we, we, sent it it, done. we sent it to um, the publisher, and it will be published in February of 2016. Okay. And then we will be doing a reading at Powell's. Oh, great, great. Yeah. Now, there's another book that I noticed mm -hmm. that there's another one that is being published this year. It's Blue Revere, Revere right? Re Reverie. Smoke, Re Reverie. Yeah. Blue Reverie in Smoke. Yeah. With 70 original poems published by the Oregon Greystone Press. Mm -hmm. The subject matter of the portrait contends with motherhood, marriage, and betrayal. The introduction was written by well-known local poet, Dan Raphael. Mm -hmm. Talk yeah. about it. So, now, are you co-authoring with this guy? No, no. Th this is, just something this is um, Dan Raphael is a poet in his own right. He's published, I think, eight or nine books of poetry, and some of them are available at Powell's City of Books. So um, I've known him for several years, and I have been writing poetry since about 2000. I'm not a prolific poetry writer. I probably write between two and three poems a year because I focus on them a lot and I, I revise them a lot. And, um, but this is a collection of my poems and it's going to be published through our publishing company, Oregon Greystone Press. And um, it's just, you know, confessional type poems um, and they do contend with, you know. Can you, can you cite one? Uh, Reach of War, Reach is, of War. A, is a war poem. It's the only war poem I ever wrote, um, and a lot of people have liked it. Um, I've written, there's a lot. I mean, I when I finally got all my poems together, because I'd saved them on, you know, CDs and floppy disks, you know. <laughs> Can you share one of these poems with us? Well, I don't, I don't, I, I don't you know, actually. <laughs> I know you got a bunch of them. I think I remember them. <laughs> I don't actually have a you copy have with me. Okay, okay. But, um, but how do you get into that? I mean, that's, that's interesting. I, I started writing poetry in 2000. And I started writing poetry as a way of helping me kind of deal with inner turmoil. Okay, okay. So it's kind of like therapy, mm -hmm. getting bad feelings out, trying okay. to process things that have happened to you. Mm -hmm. um, and so... I just started thinking about a year ago, you know, I've got a lot of poems together, you know, yeah, maybe maybe yeah. I could do this. Yeah. And so I, I contacted Dan Raphael and I sent, uh, we emailed back and forth and he said, you know, that he would consider writing the introduction. And mm -hmm. so he, what he, I had done a, a poetry reading with him in 2007 too. Mm -hmm. So he used to conduct a poetry reading at the, um, the, uh, downtown location of the um, Borders, um, it's now a Ross uh, clothing store, mm -hmm. but um, I did a reading with him in 2007 and he liked my poems that I read, and in fact I read Reach of War during that um, poetry reading, and so I contacted him and asked him if he would write the introduction to the book, and I said, you know, I, I'm going to be self-publishing this book with our publishing company, Oregon mm -hmm. Greystone Press, and he said, I would, he said he would do it with the option of being able to pull out at any time. Interesting. And I knew what he meant. <laughs> what he meant was, if it's garbage, I'm not going to write wow. the introduction. Wow. Yes. And I understood that. I completely understood that. And so I said, yeah, absolutely. You know. And so I sent him all of the poems, and he read them, and he really liked them. And he wrote a really glowing introduction, which mm -hmm. kind of floored me. Because mm -hmm. I figure if Dan Raphael likes my poetry, then it's then it's okay. Pretty well done, yeah. yeah. 
in that, in that arena? Well, he's, he's really very well known in Portland. He's kind of a legend in the poetry slam community, and he's a wonderful poet. I've, I just purchased two of his books. Um, he's just a very talented, very well-educated man, and I was really surprised mm -hmm. that he wrote such a great introduction. You know, as, I, as, I, as I listen to you, I, I, I get the take that uh, you're also encouraging others to, uh, to, yes. to write, to, to do something like this or yes. a book or whatever, because everybody's mm -hmm. in, the, in the same, right? Yeah. And people are still trying to figure out, well, I'd like to write a book, but how do I go about doing mm -hmm. that kind of stuff? Yeah. You know, okay. I, I what, do what encourage other writers. I'm um, actually, um, I just joined a, a closed Facebook group. It's called Writers Group on mm -hmm. Facebook. Mm -hmm. And it is, they've got 30,000 members. It is so much fun. Yeah. A lot of great writers and a lot of writers that aren't that great. And we just try to support each other. So I definitely support other writers yeah. and I actually maintain. Don's website, and I maintain the web the website of a friend of ours, mm -hmm. Joyce Bowles. She's a retired journalist. I maintain her website, and then I have three websites of my own. Um, so I maintain five websites through Google Sites, wow. Wow. Um, which is can be a lot of work sometimes. So you really don't have to have any background. Just get in and just start putting your thoughts on yeah. paper, right? Yeah. And just... I've taken a lot of poetry classes, oh, and okay. I've I've taken a lot of poetry and English and writing classes. So that helps, you know. I'm definitely With community college, or high school, uh, or Portland State, Portland State, Portland yeah, State. Portland okay. State. Okay. So th yeah. those are available to you. Yeah. I took four poetry classes with Primus St. John. He's uh, an African-American professor at PSU that is, mm -hmm. um, he just recently retired, I think, mm -hmm. three years ago. And I was so fortunate to be able to take mm -hmm. four of his poetry Tell classes. Tell me, do you have a degree in order to be a, applied for, to take that class? Well, no, no. You don't have to? No. Okay. I mean, anyone can write poetry. It helps to take classes just because you learn some of the tricks and you learn um, you learn some of the dynamics a little better. Mm -hmm. It definitely helped to take poetry and writing classes, mm -hmm. but you don't have to. Anyone mm -hmm. can write poetry, mm -hmm. you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's good. It's very interesting. Mm -hmm. Hey, well, look, this is great. So I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to... We're gonna kind of divvy up. I like the idea and, and whatever, but let's let's. I'm going back to one of your 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 response in regards to why you uh, the, the, the blue reverie, right? Blue reverie, Re yeah. Reverie yeah. and smoke, mm -hmm. and you'd mentioned about the contents contends with the motherhood, marriage, and betrayal. We right. talked early on about the the whole issue of Planned Parenthood mm -hmm. and, and and the abortion issue aspect of it, and and it's very political now, as you know. I mean, should we got the political deal? But as I indicated to you before, and we talked about this piece, I wasn't interested in getting into the whole issue, women issues. Mm -hmm. It's a women's issue, just like we have male issues aspect of it. But it's a very serious issue. And, and I've always had this question, now I've gotten this question, with all of our sophistication, thinking about the whole issue of killing babies and things of that nature, with all, and, and Planned Parenthood is the, sort of the mainstay, because there are many other entities out there that are basically doing the same thing, but the fact they're there, and with all of our sophistication and like and whatever, why is it that we can't come up with a, an answer as to whether or not, in fact, they were killing babies? I, I just don't understand it. Well, any, any thoughts? You know, abortion is such an impossible issue yeah. because there are people on one side who absolutely feel that every conceived life has a right to live right. and a right to be born. There, There's the other camp that says, 11-year-old girls who are raped by their father, their uncle, or their brother shouldn't be forced to give birth to that okay, that okay. baby. And so it's, I mean... But that's a small percentage for it. My point is that... Right. One, one, but right. I guess the point is, let's say I accept that. I accept mm -hmm. the fact that, that that's something that should really be put on the table and says, okay, fine. Uh, well, we've got to take the consideration of the, of the woman, mm -hmm. right, of the, the female. But the rest of it about health care, is that that's the majority Right. Of, of the whole issue aspect of it. Yeah. But why can't we just set, at least define what that is mm -hmm. so that we can move on? Yeah. What's the deal? And then, and then the other point, I'm going to throw it out on the table, is that uh, mm -hmm. we're talking about a government contract of about mm -hmm. this 500 million bucks. Mm -hmm. And I've been in the construction business and I, I've had to bid on work. I had to bid on work. But this is a sole source contract, so to speak, and with one entity. And because there are other entities out there that do some of the same work, even whatever the abortion aspect of it but they have guidelines or whatever but when you put the proposal together you've got guidelines and and all these other considerations are taken mm -hmm. and then people bid on that deal mm -hmm. and at the end of the day you've got the best if you will of whatever mm -hmm. uh, you're talking about again government dollars but in this particular case with the Planned Parenthood 
it's not. It, you know, it's just, it's just a, it, it call it a sole source contract, so to speak, as if to say they're the only entity in the world, if you will, that can do this kind of a task. Mm -hmm. And that's not the case. Yeah. So, so we are arguing, rather than putting that on the table and really going to the, the you know, basically saying, okay, we're going to adhere to the contractual kind of arrangements mm -hmm. of getting the best, you know what I'm saying? That kind of a deal. But again, going, I'm putting that and I'm putting the other point about the uh, separating the health issues of women because I, I think the public does not in any, any way, shape, or form say that's, that's that, fast forward as I'm concerned, that is their major concern, mm -hmm. the health of the women. But mm -hmm. this other piece is sort of like tainting it a bit. Any yeah, thoughts about it, that? That's true. The, the, you mean the, the researching of the fetal tissue? Yeah, yeah. It, it really is tainting the other part of Planned Parenthood. Planned Parenthood is really important. It's important for women to have access to uh, birth control. It's important for women to have access to medical care if they get a venereal disease. Mm -hmm. um, it, that part of it is really important and so I, I understand that the fetal tissue for research part of it is very controversial. I'm probably not the best person to ask um, but about why not? this. But, why not? Yeah, well, but, but I guess the point, all, all I'm saying is this, why couldn't they have just said, okay, fine, we're out of that business? Right. Exactly. Why didn't they just yeah. say, hey, I'm, we're out of that business. That's not what we do. We're yeah. just about the health. We're mm -hmm. not in that whole business. And then put that on the table. Because I was really yeah. I was a little disappointed in all due respect with the president mm -hmm. when, he, when he basically sided, if you will, with it. You know, then it becomes a, a, a political issue. Yeah. You know, because you know, I, I think... Republicans are, quote, on the other side, mm -hmm. and, the, and the Democrats are... No right, the, the Republicans are like, let's, the let's, let's stop funding for, the, for Planned Parenthood completely right now. And that simply can't be the case because what about all these women that would end up pregnant and we don't need any more babies that can't be raised properly yeah, by yeah, their parents. Yeah. So I see what you mean. But because then, the abortion issue, that's the key. Mm -hmm. Take yeah. it out of the deal. But at the yeah. same time, I want a bidding process now yeah. from this day forward. I mean, that, mm -hmm. I think that's justifiable, yeah. you know my point, yeah. and, and get the best entity that can do the cares I, I and maybe spread it out to other, a lot of other small mm -hmm. business, if you will, to get them to the table. I think it would be interesting to find out how long this fetal research has been going on because I don't even know how long. Yeah. I yeah. think it's pretty recent, yeah. like maybe the last 15 or 20 years, yeah. um, but I still don't understand why it's so important. Yeah. You know? Well, the other thing too, and you think again, I didn't, I didn't have any idea about what Planned Parenthood was all about. So, you know, you, we, we got the, we, everyone has their own encyclopedia now. It's mm -hmm. called the smartphone, right? Mm -hmm. So right, you Google right. it, you Google it, right? <laughs> the Oracle, and, yeah. And then, you, and then you're reading this stuff and it's making this statement about, hey, the, uh, one of the major purposes of Planned Parenthood was to kill black folks. Right. It blows right. my mind. Right. You know what I'm saying? Right. And there's a large number of, of African American yes. girls that are. I mean, that's yeah. huge. And then, you know, then all of a sudden, they, and the idea that their, their locations are in, in poor neighborhoods right. and black neighborhoods aspect of it, it bothers me. And it bothers sure. me about how other, how blacks who are, because everybody's got to eat, mm -hmm. they're able to find different organizations, in all due respect, the NAACP, the Urban League, and several others like that. Uh, they're, they're, they're willing to sign off, if you will. Of saying plant point, you know, plant point is is racist from the Republican standpoint that that they're making the going on, but without reading, all you do is just pick up the, the deal and read it. Mm -hmm. And I would ask that question, what's going on here? Mm -hmm. yeah. And that bothers me. Mm -hmm. sure. And I would hope and I would encourage, if you will, the uh, the black community, if you will, to check that out. In fact, I I would have I would have thought that the president would have read it. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's a very articulate kind of an individual, you mm -hmm. know. And just and Michelle, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. just. Just get down to that point. If that statement was made by the black community, by by them to, towards the black community, something is wrong. I think that with um, the reality that more black babies are aborted than white babies, and that is the case. Yeah. I think that reality is Just a that. lot. Well, it, it's a lot like black on black crime. Yeah. People don't want to talk about it. Wow. That's wow. the unfortunate thing. But we, People hey, don't want to talk about we it. We have to talk about right. it. Right. And that's I why I'm, I'm sort of yes. bringing it. And then there, are, I, in all due respect, in terms of in terms of numbers, mm -hmm. there are more white babies, mm -hmm. if you will, that are aborted. I mean, we, it's a mm -hmm. percentage in regard okay. ten percent of the population. Mm -hmm. you know, but there's right. a great. You see what I'm saying? I see what you mean. But yeah. the fact of the matter is, we're killing folks. Right. If that's the case, I want to know why. If it's not, then put it on the table and say it's not. And I think that there should be more information um, made available to the public about late-stage abortions. Exactly. Who does them? Exactly. Because 
I don't it. believe in late stage abortions exactly. uh, from about four months to six months. Exactly. I simply don't believe in that. I think exactly. it's really immoral, especially a six month old fetus, exactly. because six month old fetuses are born naturally, exactly. prematurely, exactly. and they live. So, exactly. yeah. so I, again, again, I, I, I challenge two entities. Mm -hmm. I, I challenge the uh, Democratic Party because they are the kind of like the entities that's in control, mm -hmm. and I challenge the. Uh, the first black president, uh, President Obama, mm -hmm. to, to get to the bottom of this piece because it's a very, very important piece because yeah. it's dividing a lot of folks. Yes. And, uh, and so in all due respect, I, I commend the, the Republican Party for bringing it to the table. Mm -hmm. And regardless yeah. of what they say, it's on the table. Sure. They're making it an issue from a national standpoint. And at the end of the day, hopefully those questions, those two questions that I mm -hmm. asked will be resolved so we can go on about our lives and, mm -hmm. and getting work and getting people employed and mm -hmm. dealing with some of the other major issues that we have, right. both from a national perspective, but also from a local perspective. Mm -hmm. It's very, very important. Yeah. But I, want to, I just wanted to kind of throw that out mm -hmm. to, to you because sure. it's still a woman's issue. <laughs> right, right. And and as soon as you can start resolve this, I can get off that bandwagon mm -hmm. <laughs> because I've got my issues as a mm -hmm. male. <laughs> and, but, but, but with you guys, I mean, it's, it's, I think it's very, very important. Because we've got the Roe versus Wade. I mean, they're getting ready to celebrate that piece. And uh, mm -hmm. I've got some things about uh, the Roe versus Wade in terms of why the rationale for that during that particular time. Because people are associating that with, the, with quote, the quick pill, so mm -hmm. to speak. Yeah. And it's easier to go on an abort and then... And the Planned Parenthood are part of process, part of that process. You mean like the the morning after? Pill? Yes, yeah, that yeah, kind of a deal. Yeah. So now there's a, hey, you just just go on knock on the door, they'll take care of it. And, mm -hmm. and I've been doing some things with Bill Diaz and whatever, and uh, talking about going into the schools, Portland public schools, where the majority of, of the blacks were there, in that particular arena, and it just it's it's, it's really a problem aspect mm -hmm. of it. So again, I'm going to hopefully get some folks to come and talk about that. Sure. Maybe you might want to do a little research yeah, about yeah. Roe versus Wade. Okay. Please do that, would you? <laughs> so right. we talk about that? More and more projects. I appreciate that very much. Okay? All right. Okay. Well, it's been, a, it's been a pleasure, Teresa. Yes. And you tell Don, your husband, I say thanks very much. Okay. He's doing good work. And, and to those out there who are hopefully the department will pick up some of these books and some of these readings and get a little background in history. And I would encourage the public, if you will. To, to quote get involved in, in some of the things that we've been mm -hmm. talking about because at the end of the day we do need law enforcement mm -hmm. you know we do want to have engagement from the from the people who are basically writing off the bill mm -hmm. and, and it's a very very important piece so again thank you thank you very very much thank you appreciate it okay good pleasure yes okay folks you've had the show guess what uh, we'll see you next week and uh, it's going to be an enjoyable day enjoy your day god bless all of you have a good one